Affordable housing has long been an issue here in New Hampshire, a serious problem with no easy solution. But amid the pandemic, things have reached another level. And on top of that, we have an eviction moratorium expiring, and there's associated uncertainty with that change as well. Here this morning to discuss are Dean Kristen of the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and Elliot Berry from New Hampshire Legal Assistance, who directs the Housing Justice Project. Thank you both, gentlemen, for joining us. And Dean, let's start with you. When I talk to people trying to find a place to live right now, whether it's renting or buying, they ask me what the heck is going on, and I don't have a good answer. So how would you describe what's going on right now in the housing market? Well, the market in New Hampshire it has been very tight, very active for some time, and it has become more so, I think, in the last few months. So the pandemic has clearly had an impact, particularly on the for sale side of the market, with more people interested in buying homes. That's driven prices up. It's added competition. It's made it more difficult for people to enter that market. And one of the implications of that is that people who normally would be moving into the rental market are not able to do that. And so that puts even more pressure on the rental market. It's an extremely tight market. Vacancy rates on the rental side are extraordinarily low, the lowest we've ever seen, um, um, under 1% in most markets. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure upward on rents. Um, and inventory on the for sale side is also at extraordinarily low levels. In most places, uh, under a month worth of inventory, meaning it would take less than a month to clear out everything that's on the market. I'm also putting a lot of pressure on prices. So um, it is a, it is in fact a unique time, one that people haven't seen before. It is a, the result of a strong economy, a lot of demand for housing and to a degree, the result of the pandemic. It's also a result of frankly not producing enough housing to meet demand over quite a few years. And Elliot, we'll give you a shot at this too. How do you explain what's going on in the housing market right now in the Granite State? Well, I have to agree with Dean that at the end of the day, the biggest single factor is that not enough housing ha uh, has been produced. Um, you know, another thing that people don't talk about a lot is that the uh, the federal government over decades now has really cut back on the amount of subsidized housing that's being produced. They're throwing out a lot of vouchers, still not nearly enough to help people pay for the housing that there is. Um, but the decades long uh, retreat by the federal government in the creation of housing that's affordable to you know, lower income people um, it, it is really coming home to roost right now. Sticking with you, Elliot, now that the eviction moratorium is about to expire, what's going to happen in the weeks and months ahead? Are we looking at a slow motion disaster or are the resources in place to help enough people? <laughs> that's the that's the big question that everybody is trying to figure out. Um, there are a lot of resources out there and the challenge uh, is to do everything possible to make sure that people who need the assistance and are eligible for it. And I think there's a lot of people, uh, they go out and, you know, that we find them and make sure that they're able to apply for it. I think so many institutions, uh, starting with deans, New Hampshire Housing, the court system, the community action agencies, uh, the legal aid programs, there's um, so many institutions uh, are, are doing everything they can to get the word out uh, that that money is available and to make sure that people apply for it. Uh, but nevertheless, there are a lot of people out there who, you know, are, don't use computers, um, who uh, don't speak English, um, and who are, you know, elderly people in rural areas. Uh, those are the ones that are really hard to reach and uh, we're, you know, everybody's gonna keep trying. But it, And then there are people who aren't eligible for it. So, um, <laughs> They're clearly going to be an uptick in evictions, certainly a major uptick in the number that are filed. But um, just because the eviction is filed, that doesn't mean that the it's going to end in the person actually being put out of their home. Because, uh, again, everybody, uh, once the eviction is filed, the court system is also informing people of the opportunity to use the emergency rental assistance program. And I'm really hopeful that notwithstanding a big spike in the number of actions, eviction actions filed, I'm very hopeful that many, many of them will, uh, uh, will be terminated because the emergency rental assistance program uh, will bail these folks out. Dean, what about foreclosures? We've got changes coming on the horizon, likely there as well. Uh, are we going to see an increase there in a couple of months? 
Well, I think the foreclosure dynamic will be a little different in that um, there are a number of very um, significant programs in place already to try to mitigate uh, against an increase in foreclosures. Most of the federal agencies that are in the mortgage uh, space um, are providing lots of flexibility to borrowers who are at risk, and that really constitutes about 70 percent, we believe, of all the mortgages in the state. Uh, there are forbearance opportunities and other workout and uh, other mechanisms that are available to people. And there will be additional federal resources that will be coming online very soon to provide direct help to people as necessary. We're basically just waiting for some additional guidance from the U.S. Treasury Department to be able to finalize that program and get that program in place. So I'm, I'm hopeful that there will not be a significant uptick in foreclosures. I mean, the CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau is basically enacting a regulation next month that makes it extremely difficult for servicers to, uh, to pursue foreclosures except in limited circumstances. But certainly um, in the cases where people are at risk solely or primarily because of the dynamic around uh, COVID, uh, there is going to be a, a lot of resources available to them over the next few months. Dean, you mentioned the vacancy rate earlier, 0.6% uh, here in New Hampshire. That's not a typo, right? Uh, you know, how does that compare to other states and regions around the country? And expand a little bit more on the pressure that puts on the rest of the system. So, so uh, the regional numbers that, that we're aware of are that uh, vacancy rates in the New England Northeastern region are around 6.8%. Um, and uh, nationally, it, it tends to hover around that same number, 6.8%, 7%. So it's not a typo, 0.6%. And, and for two-bedroom units is, in fact, what we found when we did our recent survey. And again, that won't cover every single market in the state, but it gives you a sense of the overall dynamic. Um, it is a very, very difficult market for people to access housing, which is why a lot of those resources, a lot of that partnership that Ellie was speaking to, uh, to try to avoid evictions is critical. Uh, because once people are uh, displaced, it's going to be very difficult for them to find other places to live. And I do think there's been an enormous amount of effort done by a lot of partners to try to make sure that that program is, is up and operational. $30 million has already moved out to about 45 or 4,600 households, uh, 2,500 or more landlords who received assistance for the program, um, and there's more being assisted every week. So. That program is a really valuable resource. It is important that we continue to remind people about its availability, and we encourage folks to, to apply uh, through the CAP agencies for uh, that resource on an ongoing basis. And Elliot, we know that people do have a little bit more time now when it comes to being able to pay off uh, some rent there when they're facing eviction. Can you pl explain what's going on with pay and stay? And really, I mean, it's a kind of a landlord choice right now, how long they want to wait. Yeah, so until very recently, when the governor signed SB 126, uh, a tenant had the right to pay, and uh, if they, when they fell behind, if they got an eviction notice, uh, they had the right to um, cure that eviction by paying the rent. Um, but that expired after the seven days um, when the eviction notice expired. Under SB 126, the um, the tenants going to have till the time of the actual hearing um, to um, to pay and stay. So that's a that's a very significant expansion of that right, and it dovetails very well with the emergency rental assistance program. Uh, so hopefully, people again will have time to access that. Uh, and I'm hoping that where people uh, have applications pending on the hearing date, that I believe that many judges will. Uh, will grant continuances or postponements uh, until the um, a decision can be made. That's my hope, and I think that's going to happen um, yeah. in an appropriate case. Hmm. Uh, Dean, everybody seems to agree affordable housing is a good thing, but when it comes time for communities to actually build something, we always see the single families getting the priority uh, there. There's the aversion to multifamily. How, how do you change that? Well, I think you change it in part with education, and we've been working hard with a lot of partners over the years to try to do that. You change it in part, frankly, with the legislation. The, the, the legislature has adopted a number of provisions over the last few years and really over the last 10 years 
that are designed to encourage local governments to be more flexible about this issue. But in the end, um, it really is about policy making at the local level. And the way to get there is with education, with um, with persuading people that there is value in having a broad range of different housing opportunities in the state. Diversity of housing is critical to our economy and to the future of the state. And it's, it's important not just for the state, if you will, or regions, but for individual communities to think hard about uh, the availability of housing in, in their community and what they may be doing either deliberately or just unconsciously that interferes with the ability of the private sector to build the housing that they need. Elliot, on a parallel track here, another housing issue is housing discrimination. How big of a problem is that still in New Hampshire? You know, that's a really hard uh, question to answer, Adam. Uh, I think it clearly exists, um, but let's face it, most uh, most landlords who aren't inclined to engage in that discrimination uh, are know that it's illegal and can be pretty clever about uh, about coming up with other uh, allegedly non-discriminatory reasons. Um, it, it, I don't have a good way to measure it, um, pure and simple. We do know we see a lot of cases, uh, whether it's discrimination against families with children, uh, whether it's based on race or national origin. Um, I mean, we have a steady, our disability, um, we have a steady stream of those cases, but um, again, uh, I just don't have a way to quantify it for you. And Dean, last question for you here, and uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, obviously, housing plays into homelessness. Do you think we're going to see a surge a little bit in the next couple of months, or will that be mitigated? Well, I certainly hope not, and I think a lot of the, 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 the resources that have been put in place, the partnerships, the things we've talked about, are designed to avoid that from happening. Um, that said, uh, it will take you know a continued considered effort by all of those partners to make sure that the people that are at risk learn about these programs, get access to them, and we avoid displacement. All right, Dean Kristen and Elliot Berry, thank you, gentlemen, both for your time on Close Up this morning. Thank you. Thank you.